You are listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. I'm Elena Paventa, Executive Communication Coach and TEDx Organizer. With each episode, I'll share with you communication tips and ideas from top business leaders to help you excel in your career. Hello, welcome everyone to our next episode of Ideas and Leaders podcast. Today, I have a great guest with me. It is Latonia Wilkins, and she's working with executives, professionals, and teams to build cultures of belonging. Hi, Latonia. It's great to have you on the podcast. Great. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So, Latonia, uh, what does it mean to build a culture of belonging? I know it is a very broad question to start with, but where do we start if we want to do this? That is a broad question. Well, um, a little bit about what I do. So um, I'm an author. I am an executive and team coach. And I mainly coach organizations to create cultures of belonging. I also do a lot of learning sessions on creating cultures of belonging, including culture academies. And so how do I could talk a little bit about how I approach this. So uh, my book, Leading Below the Surface, kind of lays out all the ways and the intricacies around building a culture of belonging that, that I take on. But it, it really starts with um, learning and looking at look, kind of looking inside of yourself first. And so kind of evaluating yourself at your core. How can you as a person create a culture of belonging? Are, you, are there things that, that you need to settle inside of yourself? How can you become more empathetic? How can you become more psychologically safe? How can you become like more of a real leader? I talk a little bit about that. And then I spend real time with with these teams and with these executives over several months. And we do some coaching around, you know, how to maintain this, um, what's coming up, what's what's challenging. And yeah, over time, the culture sticks. So that's a little bit about how I do it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, your book is called Leading Below the Surface, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. How to build real and psychologically safe relationships with people who are different from you. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what what does it mean leading below the surface? Uh, how, how can you define this? Yeah. So leading below the surface, I, I actually um, have been doing this for quite some time and I didn't really have a name for it. So, so let me go back to one of the first stories where I experienced a below the surface leader. So I, it was after um, in the US the 9-11 uh, attacks and I knew that I was gonna lose my job after the attacks. Um, my job was already kind of hanging by a thread and it was the one thing that pushed me over. And so I knew that I was, I was going to be laid off. And so what happened that day is my boss at the time came, she did a few things. Like she called me up and she said, Hey, I need to talk to you about, you know, the future, your future here. And I knew exactly what it was about. And she, she decided to drive to me. Uh, I didn't have to go to her. And when she came to my office, she actually sat across from me. So she sat in the position that was not in a position of power. Uh, she sat in a position, and I know you do a lot of communication. You talk a lot about communication on this podcast, but there's always a power position in the room. And she yeah. intentionally did not sit in that power position. And we ended up having a dialogue about how I was going to, my job would be eliminated, but she had another opportunity for me. It was going to be a step down. She checked in with me the entire time. She was listening empathetically. She was observing me. Uh, she she kind of played things back. Like I could tell this is really upsetting to you. You know what else? What can I do for you to make this conversation a little um, more productive? And she did all of these amazing things. And I never had that happen before. And that's exactly what a below the surface leader is. I, in the book, I talk about like real leaders and the four 
uh, characteristics of a below the surface leader. And it's relatable, equitable, aware, and loyal. And that's real leaders. And she did all of those things really well. People would always say she was a good person, but it was so much more than that. And so over the years, I started um, calling it below the surface leader. And I, I also uh, paired that with a lot of research around this. And so it's so it was a valid model. So that's a little bit about below the surface leadership and, and how I first encountered mine. Great, great. That's a great story. And uh, I think that uh, it is very important what you say that to build a culture in the organization or in the team, we need to start from ourselves from uh, our personality so we cannot just tell everyone okay so we have this culture let from now on we're acting this way we need to uh, start kind of to bring uh, to, to bring this culture to the team and as a leader and many of our listeners are leaders they are entrepreneurs or uh, they, they are leaders in their teams so what can we do, what can we start doing differently in order to start introducing this, um, th this uh, below the surface leadership yeah. to our teams? Yeah, so like I said, there are three prongs that I talk about. Um, real leadership, which I just told you, relatable, equitable, aware, and loyal, empathy. And the third one is creating psychologically safe relationships. And so the, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna say empathy. Uh, and in the book, I talk about empathy being a fallback for below the surface leadership. Empathy is accessible. Every, everyone can access it. Everyone can get to it. You just have to choose to do it. And so I, I talk about it as a fallback in the way that, for example, if you wanna start being more mindful and practicing more meditation and you skip a day, your fallback might be taking 10 deep breaths, right? And so empathy is like that, the below the surface fallback. And how do you do that? Well, I talk about different ways that you can listen in my book. I talk about person to person listening, kind of how we're doing now, where you are listening with multiple senses, you, you don't have your phone out, you reduce distractions, you're playing back what people are saying. I mean, I want everyone that's listening to this to think back to the last time someone asked you a question and you knew that they weren't even listening to you. They asked the question and when you answered it, for example, what did you do this weekend? And you're telling them everything that you did and you know that they're not listening, uh, they tune out. So P2P listening is the opposite of that person to person listening. Person to belonging listening is another type of listening that I talk about in my book. And what that means is that instead of you talking and engaging in a group, if, especially if you're a leader, you're spending more time observing and you're valuing that time observing. And you're seeing when you're ob observing, you're observing the extent to which people belong. You're observing if someone is taking over the group. You're observing if someone is climbing up or if they're quiet. You're observing if people don't seem to be receiving the team very well. And so that's person of belonging listening. A lot of us don't do that. Again, a lot of us as leaders, we think, we have to go in and control the meeting. We have to go in and steer the meeting. But actually you um, observing is extremely valuable and a really great way to, to build that empathy muscle. So again, um, lean on empathy, that's where you start. Uh, and there's two different types of way to, ways to access that. I talk a lot about in the book. Again, person to person listening, you could practice that every day. And then person to belonging listening, where you're becoming more an of an observer. Yes, so thank you. Thank you so much for, for saying this. And I think that this is so important that uh, we understand that leadership is not only about giving presentations and, you know, standing right. in the spotlight on the stage and telling everyone what to do. It is uh, very much about listening, listening to others and, and uh, supporting them. I think that this is... Um, uh, a little bit of old school uh, of leadership that we observe still sometimes when we see, we, we see leaders mm -hmm. who are very talkative, who Absolutely. think that they're always right. And usually this model of leadership does not work. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a lot of it comes from insecurity, right? Like um, we are so uncomfortable with silence and we're really uncomfortable with observing, but it, it goes back to the 
to the saying where people said, it's not about how much you say, it's about what you say. And so you might be observing 90% of the time and then you have a powerful comment and that goes for anyone. So never feel bad about, you know, being the most talkative one in the room. Um, you know, think about like Yoda, for example. I mean, Yoda was very, like very quiet and, and very inquisitive. And then when Yoda had something to say, it was something that was profound. And so try to be that profound person, not just the talkative person. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I just today I had a call with a coaching call with one of my clients and we were speaking about this. She said that, you know, I'm so intimidated by one of the, the people in my team that he's always so confident and he's speaking in a very loud way, always making jokes, telling stories about how he traveled the world. And uh, I, I told her that don't try to be someone else. You're different. You have a different personality. And if someone is like this, it doesn't mean that you need to, in order to be a leader, you need to behave uh, like him. So I think that right. uh, it is so important what you say that yeah, we can be Yoda. <laughs> yeah, that's an example you don't want to follow, <laughs> right? That's like the, um, it, I talk a lot about the dominant, leadership uh, standard in my book. And I think that kind of goes back to that where there's the standard of being loud, of competition, of you know pushing others to the side, but you don't have to do that. And that's, again, that's the opposite of below the surface leadership. Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, Latonia, you say, uh, you say that uh, organizations are getting diversity and inclusion wrong. And this is uh, very interesting for me because I can see that this is now mm -hmm. a trend that every organization has this diversity and inclusion. And so why do you think that they're there? What are they doing wrong and how can we fix it? Well, this is a prime example of what's wrong. Um, someone came to me last week and uh, wanted me to do some coaching for their org. And the first thing she said to me was, you know, it's alarming how I see all these websites that of people that say they are diversity experts, but they have no background in that. Like, I don't see anything that convinces me that they have the experience to do that. And I, I told her to, to elaborate on that a little bit more. And what she said is that, it's, it's so much more than uh, training. It's all about culture change and it's all about people change and changing at the core. And I thought that was really interesting that she said that because you know what, what that taught me is that organizations are starting to see what DEI really is. And it really is about cultural change, right? It's not about training. It's not about compliance. It's about changing your culture, which is really hard and that's why people take off these little bite-sized pieces of, hey, I'm just gonna do the training, I'm just gonna do this piece, I'm just gonna do the compliance. And so, you know, what that what that looks like is that organizations are are really um, trying to to change, and it, it's just again what we're not doing that on a whole. I think there are so many people that. Again, I think it's great to have a lot of folks out there that are committed to DEI, but it's it's again, it's it takes large scale change. And that's what we're getting wrong. I think we're getting excited about, oh, well, my company gave back to a community. So that's that's diversity. And we've checked the box for the year. Or my company has two senior executives that, for example, are women out of like seven people. So that checks the diversity box. But again, the diversity on that team may be visible, but when you talk to those two women, nine times out of 10, they're not happy, right? Nine times out of 10, they're pushed to the side. So that's what's broken. Um, I actually hate uh, DEI and like how we refer to it because before I became an author and um, you know ran my own business, I was in big companies and DEI just didn't work for me. And it was supposed to work for people like me and I'm the people it didn't work for. And so again, if there's a lot of check boxes like, oh, we have an employee resource group, great. 
or, oh, we have a couple of leaders, great. Or we have this training, great. Yeah, that stuff is fun and all, but it doesn't really create like a, a, a change. It doesn't really create like um, something different. And so that's what I mean by DEI is broken. And it still is because again, I think that um, there's a lot to come. I still think the field is in its adolescence. I think it's continuing to mature. And I think companies are starting to see that, you know, they're dumping money into a lot of this. Like, I think there was like a billion dollars spent and there's little change and there's little movement. And so people are starting to see what it really is. And that's what needs to happen for DEI be to become more legitimate. Yeah, yeah. I think that I understand what you're saying because I also see that companies have budgets for certain things and they just tick the box. So, okay, I'm organizing this conference. I'm right. sponsoring this event. And this is this is enough for me to, uh, that I spent money on, on this issue, but they don't want to actually fix the problem. Uh, so do you, right. do you see the solution? What, what uh, can the companies do? What can we do? And uh, team leaders in the companies do to change it? That's a really good question. And I'm really glad you asked that because I do, I think it starts with managers, honestly. I think it starts um, with uh, met, like frontline managers and middle managers. There's too many times where we, we try to go top down and um, and when you go top down, I mean, it's great to have the senior leadership into it, giving money to it, all that stuff. But what happens is like the, there's there's usually a communication breakdown in the middle and they don't really know exactly, you know, what the DEI strategy is. So like if you ask, for example, you know, a large company um, what their DEI strategy, if you ask their middle managers, they probably don't know. Their executive team might know because they, they're the ones that invested in it, but the middle managers have probably have no idea. And they probably have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. So what can you do? Well, like I think one of the things you can do is start to think up about DEI differently and for what it is. And um, you know, it's like what I write about in my book. It's about, it's about leading below the surface. It's about you know, bringing this in, bringing inclusion into your leadership today. It's like, think about how you lead today and how you define your leadership. Bring, again, bringing, um, like bringing below the surface leadership into that. And again, that looks like, um, again, real leadership, being relatable, equitable, aware, and loyal. Like thinking about those things all together. Like, am I relatable to my team? Do I have equitable practices on my team? Am I aware of how I am as a leader? Am I loyal to my team, even when they make mistakes? Empathy, again, practicing the listening, um, the empathetic listening, accessing that. Um, and then the third is creating psychological, psychologically safe relationships. We haven't talked about this a lot, but psychological safety is that, you know, your team can make mistakes without repercussions. They could speak out without repercussions. They could be wrong without repercussions, right? Like all those things, they could bring themselves to work without repercussions, without being afraid. Like they're safe, they have that psychological safety. And those three prongs, if you could focus on that, then you're gonna be way closer to being inclusive and creating a culture of belonging on your team than you would with practicing, you know, again, traditional DEI stuff, which includes like training, right? And, um, you know, yeah, of course you are gonna do some training and some learning, but again, you're, you're, you're looking at yourself from the core. And again, you're understanding, your, you're having awareness of where you are today and where you wanna go and, and you're working towards that every day. Yeah, do you have any recommendations how to actually build uh, relationships in the workplace? Because I think that it, it might be challenging for some people because they think that, okay, in a workplace, I have to be professional, no mm -hmm. need to go deeper. But uh, in fact, as you're saying, we need to focus on, on this relationship building. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, so there's a, in my keynotes, I sometimes show a study um, that was done, um, it was by a, a major, it was a US-based study. And it found that uh, the average person only has one friend of a different race. So, you know, out of 10 people uh, that you're friends with, only one of those people would be from a different race. So we live in a world where 
there's a lot of affinity bias, right? We we migrate towards people who are similar to to us. It's it's just it's proven. We also have in group bias, and that means that we once we are in that group and we migrate towards people who are similar to us, we have a bias towards that group. We're more empathetic towards that group. We we think that group is probably better than a lot of people outside of that group. So I think the first step is just acknowledging our biases we have as human beings. I have them too, that we have this affinity bias, right? We have this in-group bias. And you know, taking a minute and just writing down, um, I'm gonna ask all of you to do this, write down your top 10 contacts at work right now. I'm sure all those people are people that are similar to you. And I'm sure that study has actually reiterated itself on its findings, right? Maybe one or two of those people are different from you. Right, unless you're forced to work with them. Again, these are people that you're choosing to interact with at work that you that you actually want to have lunch with. So how do you how do you change that? Well, one is again starting to evaluate your networks, right, and um, making it a goal to connect with people who are different from you. And and how do you do that? Well, you go into a conversation a little bit differently, and it's a lot of the things that I talked about today. Instead of going into the conversation and you being like, hey, where did you go to school? Oh, that, I went to school there too. Oh, did you like that professor? Like reminiscing about things you have in common. Be empathetic, ask questions um, with curiosity. Listen with curiosity. You know, actually engage with that person. Create a psychologically safe relationship with them. Be relatable, understand that, you know, like me and you, Elena, the way that we relate to each other may be different from how we relate to the people on the top 10 list. So it's just kind of setting out to do it, just having more patience with it. It may not come as naturally and that's okay. But later, I mean, you, you see the research out there on teams, it says, you know, with diversity, um, you know, a lot of people quote that diverse teams are more productive. Well, actually there's a drop in production first because there's a drop off because People are different and they have to figure out how to work together. And then in the longer run, that's when that, that production actually increases and gets better. And so it's gonna be the same when you're, when you're trying to talk to people who are different from you. You might have to listen differently. You might have to interact differently. You might have to relate in a different way and that's natural. And so, yeah, that's how you do it. Again, question your biases and set out your goals on what you wanna do, you know, evaluate that top 10 and go out and, Again, practice empathetic listening, be relatable, and create psychologically safe relationships. Wow, this is so motivating. I, I'm already motivated to contact someone from, not from my top 10. <laughs> <laughs> so I will definitely do this. And I hope that our listeners also got motivated to go out of their bubbles and uh, reach out to someone that is maybe a little bit different from them. And I must tell you, Latonia, that I have an, I have an experience with uh, diverse teams and the diverse teams, in my opinion, in, in my experience, they are the most effective ones. For example, mm -hmm. even currently yeah. I'm organizing mm -hmm. an event, yeah. a TEDx event, and we have team uh, we, we have in, in the team, we have people from about maybe 18 years old, girls who are still in school. They are super fluent in, in uh, TikTok, in social media, and they are helping a lot with marketing and everything. And then we have people who are almost 60 years old and they have amazing business networks and they can help with completely other things and this synergy i think that uh the the difference in in age in in uh, gender nationalities uh, and this mixed group it creates this mm -hmm. perfect outcome because people are literally they are thinking outside the box some some ideas right. they're like wow really i never thought about this and people are surprising all the time so i think that this is the magic of of a diverse mm -hmm. team that i am i am experiencing it right now as well yeah yeah and that's an excellent example um and, and again it, it might take some time to get there but once you're there it's magical right and you're you're going to be on amongst the most productive teams that you've ever been on once you get past those humps 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. So to summarize uh, what we were discussing, so what uh, do we need to do to go step by step to this uh to, to, to build this culture of belonging in our team. First, we need to start with ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, start with yourselves. Uh, I, you know, do a lot of reflection. And in, in my book, I offer a lot of places for re reflection because I don't think, honestly, leaders don't do enough of it where you could kind of, again, evaluate where you are today. And you don't have to share that with anyone, but just kind of honestly, you know, evaluate where you are today. And then think about what success looks like um, and, and think about, again, like be very, very specific about that. Um, the third thing is kind of think about what, where, where is your culture now? And I talk, I, I talk about this in my book around getting below the culture surface. Like if you don't understand where your, what your culture is now, then you can't get to the culture where you wanna be. And you have to accept the muck of that culture, right? If that culture is a culture of exclusion, if that culture is a culture that is very homogenous, you have to accept that. So, so kind of start there. So that's step three. And step four is keep moving and keep going through this, like repeat all those steps over and over again. Um, you know, share your slips along the way. Like if you if you make a mistake, if you're if you're not, um, if you skip some things, if you cut some corners, share those slips with other people. If you have reactions from your your staff that you're not expecting share all that and so yeah those are those are some high level ways to get there yeah yeah uh, thank you so much latonia for all your tips and inspiration so i think that it is really important for us and for, for our listeners to understand that uh, culture of belonging culture of inclusion it does not uh, we cannot have a top-down approach in this. So it starts from us, from ourselves. We need to bring it to the team with us, with our leadership skills. We cannot just throw money at the problem and, uh, it, and the issue will uh, disappear. So thank you very much for what you're doing and uh, for, for your book. So if our listeners want to reach out to you, to contact you or to, to learn more about your books, where can they find you? Yeah, so if you want to check out the book, you can go to leadingbelowthesurface.com. I'm also on Instagram and I'm pretty active on there. I'm at Latanya Coaching. And then I'm also on LinkedIn and I'm pretty active there at Latanya Wilkins. Perfect, perfect. So... We'll definitely have uh, all your social media handles under this episode. So if our listeners are interested, please just go there and connect with Latonia. Thank you so much for being on Ideas and Leaders. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's fun. Thank you for listening to Ideas and Leaders podcast. Did you enjoy this episode? Let me know that you listen by tagging me in your LinkedIn profile and using a hashtag ideas and leaders. See you in the next episode.